So uh, during university, one thing that I was not too terribly great at was maths. All right, so for you young people who have just now gotten through, perhaps this is something that you share in common with me. I, I was not too terribly great at it, and um, I had one particular professor uh, who would write uh, her, her exams, and at the top of the exam it would say, show all your work or you will get no credit. That's what she liked to put. Show all your work or you will get no credit, capitalized no credit, okay, on the uh, exam. There was room to write in your work on the page, which is not what I usually do. What I usually tend to do is take a spare piece of paper and make a complete disaster of it trying to figure out the answer. And so I was very unhappy uh, that this person has said, show all your work, because I didn't want her to see how sloppy and disorganized I really was. And so I asked her, why do we have to show all our work. Can't we just put the right answer? I didn't bring a calculator, I promise. Uh, I'm not going to cheat. But why do we have to show uh, that? And she said, well, you know, often enough, people put the right answer down, and they come to this right answer entirely wrongly. They do it all wrong. And they simply, it's almost like they just threw a dartboard, you know, they threw the dart and it hit the bullseye, but they had no idea what they were doing. So right answer, but wrong process. Right answer, but totally wrong process. And I, I get the feeling that maybe somebody just looked over and saw the answer and somehow scribbled that in, right? They, they might have cheated or something. Um, we can have the right answer, but totally have the wrong process getting there. And so in a way, it's kind of the wrong answer. She actually said, well, I'll give you tons of credit if you go the right direction and don't get the right answer. If I can see that you had the right process, well, then I'm gonna give you points back. But if you got the right answer, but you did the wrong process, you will get no points. Uh, I think we understand this. I, uh, you know, the holidays club, the uh, holiday club is coming up, and I hope that you've signed up for it. And if you have spare time, if you don't, fine, great. But if you have spare time, the holiday club is up, and and what happens during the holiday club inevitably is that we'll ask some sort of question like, "Who loves us?" and uh, has died for our sins, and then all the children will unanimously say, Jesus! Now, the next thing to do is without changing your facial expressions from what they were before, you say, and who is our adversary who stands against us? And there will be at least three or four kids that go, Jesus! Because that's the right answer. It's the normal answer, but it's wrong, right? We don't really understand. Now this morning, as we look at the triumphal entry, when we look, it's called the triumphal entry, uh, at, the, at the end of which Jesus weeps, so maybe it wasn't as triumphant as we thought it might be, but what we see is we see people with the right answer. Jesus is king, Jesus is Messiah, Jesus rules, um, but the wrong process. They don't, they don't really understand what he's come for, what his kingdom is about, and if they did understand, they would be reluctant to sign on to that. And we're invited to really think about who, who Jesus really is as a king, as a Messiah, as Christians. That's a question we have to answer for ourselves. So if you're not there already, we're on page 1015, the little green Bibles that you've been handed when you came in. And we're going to start in verse 1 and read. And the first thing I want to show uh, is let's begin by singing who Jesus really is, and then he, he tells you who he is, and he is Lord. He, that's, that's the terminology that he wishes to go by. He is Lord. So uh, let's read, starting in verse 1. They approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage, Bethany, and at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go out to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, who, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it. And we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found the colt outside the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing, untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. 
So a bit of context, it was about three weeks ago that we began talking about Jesus' final week alive. He knows that he's about to go, and he's about to die. At Jerusalem, he's told everyone this, that it was his inner circle, that is. He's told all the disciples, I'm going up to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. And you would think he would not go. But he's determined to go. And now, he's about a half mile from the city wall. And we have this strange tale about going and getting a donkey, okay? It's kind of lost on our modern ears. So let's, let's talk about what this is. This is a coronation. Jesus' disciples, as it were, are going to the royal news. They're grabbing the Bentley. They're rolling down the windows. They're putting the big loudspeaker. And as they drive down, hail the king, hail the king, king Jesus, as they're going into Jerusalem. It, it's as clear as day that this is what is going on. This is a king. It's audacious. It's confrontational to the Pharisees who believe they're the leaders of Jerusalem. That's what they secretly believe. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees, we, we rule this city. And here is this man. Up he comes to the city. Hail to the chief. And Jesus comes to challenge them. And he comes to challenge us about who is really in authority over our lives. And who really reigns. And so that's what's happening here. The cult, uh, this is what uh, royalty would uh, sit on. So David had a cult that no one else was allowed to touch, and they were not allowed to ride it. And at the end of his life, he took his animal, and he put his son on it, Solomon, and the idea was, here's the new king. This guy is going to rule in my steam. So Jesus is saying, I am a king. I am a king. Now, that's an incredible tone change for Jesus. He's you know, a very humble guy. For the last three years, he's been just healing people, feeding people from, you know, thin air, doing these amazing miracles nonstop, wherever anybody is hurt, healing them, lifting them up, teaching to them. Everything has been about loving and caring for other people. And then when people say, you're a king, Jesus says, uh, I gotta go. <laughs> he takes off and doesn't let him crown him. Which they didn't say. You're a king. I gotta run. You're really popular in this city, they say. Let's go to another city, Jesus says once. He's been trying to keep that message down. But now, he's changed his tone. Why? Because Jesus wants to be a king on his own terms. Not on our terms. Jesus doesn't want to be the king that we tell him, yeah, we're coronating you king. We, we voted you in. We have a certain set of expectations. We have a certain set of things we, we want you to do. And if you, you fulfill all those things, if you be the kind of king that we want you to be, yes, rise. Jesus is his own king. And he does what he wants. Uh, and notice, um, he... Uh, he does this all without the disciples' knowledge. He just tells them. So go down that road, and um, yeah, you'll run into these guys and say some magic words and bring the cult back to me. This is all Jesus is doing. It has nothing to do with any other person. You know, sometimes we say um, to God in our hearts, or perhaps we vocalize this to somebody else, my life hasn't gone the way I want it to go. I wouldn't run this the way you've run this, God. <laughs> God, you know, this is an interesting story you've decided to tell. Now, I don't want to belittle that, but in some ways, God's response is, yeah, well, you're not in charge. <laughs> I rule this place. I made you. I determine what I do with your life. And my plans are good, but, but he, he reigns. He, he's our king. Jesus wants to be accepted on his own terms. Now, uh, about this whole cult, um, how, how, did, uh, how did Jesus know that this animal was going to be used? Well, there's two kind of ideas on this. The first is that Jesus has this divine knowledge that there's a cult somewhere and that they can just go and find this cult and if they say these words that they'll, the disciples will be able to take the cult back. He's never met this person. So that talks about maybe his providence. Um, 
and just knowing all things, that he controls everything so carefully and so clearly. But another uh, idea would be that in, in advance, uh, he's arranged with somebody to use this animal, and the magic words to let the animal go are these words, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. Okay, so they, what's, the, what's the password? The Lord needs it. Okay, let him go. Uh, either way, th th that's the password. The password is, the Lord needs it. Now, let's say that I want a cup of coffee in the, in the morning, okay? And I say to someone here as I'm doing my thing, could you get me a cup of coffee because the Lord needs it? <laughs> what do you guys think? You think... This guy has got no chance of being the future pastor of our church. He is so full of himself, he just made himself out to be God. Right? At the very least, you'd say, give me some qualification about what that just meant there when you said that. That's a little, and that's Jesus' statement, actually. He, he's pointing, for the only time in Scripture that he really does, directly, and saying, I am a Lord. The, the Lord. The Lord. Now, the, the early church spoke of Jesus as the Lord, and they meant the Lord as in God above, God Almighty, and they meant the Lord as in entirely in control, R ruling everything. E everything is under his feet. Everything is in subjection to him. Jesus isn't saying, I, I'm, uh, yes, I'm going to be king of Jerusalem. Not, he's not saying, I'm going to be king of Israel. He's saying, I am king of everything. I am king of it all. I rule the animals, and I rule creation, and I rule eternity past, and I rule eternity present, and I am entirely in authority. And so you're not being invited to be kingmakers. You're being invited to see that I already am king, that I really, truly am. Rule is overall. Now, what's the implications of Jesus' kingdom then? Um, well, in this kingdom, what does it all revolve around? Does it all revolve around us? No, it all revolves around Jesus. It's all about him. I think outsiders uh, get this, you know. They understand that if they're to believe in Jesus, that somehow means that they're no longer the king of their own castle or the queen of their own castle. They, they've got a new king, and that they are now going to do what he wants rather than what they want. They become servants. Exactly what the Bible says of us. We become servants of God. And, you know, if the queen shows up to your house and wants you to do something, you do it. Not even because she has real authority. Because she does it. I mean, she's the queen, so you, you do it. How much more Jesus, the king of all things? It's actually the case that we're supposed to obey this king, that he's, he's ruling, and he asks us to do things, and we listen to him, and we obey, and we have changed lives, and, and our, the pattern of our life is majorly uh, turned because of following Jesus. It, it goes in a different direction than it was going. Let's say that we did this and this and this, and we want to live this way and that way, and then along comes Jesus, and, and off we go in a totally different direction because now we're servants of the king. He, he really rules. Now, some uh, Christians are surprised by this. They think of Jesus, and they think he's so loving and so merciful and so kind and so welcoming, and he is all those things. I, I, how, how can I see him as like this really in charge monarch? Uh, turn with me really quickly to John uh, chapter 15. Let's see this. Uh, from Jesus' own, own mouth, what he says here. And we'll be looking at, uh, starting in verse 12 here. Page 1083. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for their friends. You are my friends if you do what I command, or if you do whatever, whatever.
forever life and in all of it. Um, and so, yes, we have this beautiful statement by Jesus. I want you guys to love each other because I have loved you. And by the way, I'm going to love you supremely. I'm going to love you supremely by dying for you, for you, my friends. And that would be a wonderful place to leave it. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But he continues. You can reciprocate my friendship by doing what I ask. You, do you want to show me love back? Surrender and do what I ask. We call it obedience. We call it obedience. And now this lordship is absolutely for our best. He loves us supremely. But yet he's calling us to accept that he is higher than us. He's higher than us. Now, sometimes we say, I, I believe in Jesus. And that's about all we say. Or, I, I'm a Christian. Uh, what do you believe? I'm a Christian. Don't want to talk about it anymore. But we don't take seriously what God says to us. Just, just consider, you know, the last thing Jesus said. Go into all the world, make uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son. Which one of us have been really super active in that? I, I'm an assistant pastor, and... I don't do that very often. I tr I'm trying harder. Like, it's so easy to not take what he tells us and to do it. It's really tough. It's almost as if I think Jesus and I are on equal footing, and he can tell me to do some things, and if they make sense, then I'll do them. But if they don't make sense to me, I have the authority and I have the power to just say, I'll just keep you Jesus is far, 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 far above me. Higher than all thrones. Higher than all. And the only place that we can find ourselves in is heartfelt obedience. So that's point number one. Jesus is, in reality, he's Lord. Now notice how we are tempted to make less of this king even while we are affirming him. Look with me at, at verse um, 7. And they brought the cloak to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So this is the, uh, the royal red carpet, as it were. This is what you did when you wanted to make a big scene in the ancient world for a dignitary, for a king. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It, it's, it's a party, okay? People are dancing around in circles, and they've got stuff. They're waving stuff in the air, and they're singing happy songs. Psalms 118 is what they're quoting here. It's a very happy psalm. It's a praise psalm. Okay? They're, they're very excited. They're thrilled. They're laying their coats before Jesus, which is to say that's their pledge. That's kind of like taking the pledge and saying, I, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow your kingdom. I'm going to be, I belong to you now, and I will do what you say. So here they are doing all this. It's a great scene, and they're saying things like, you're, you're the Messiah, essentially. The, the kingdom is coming in you. You're going to reign. You're, you're David's great-grandson, right? The great-great-great-grandson. Just like uh, the blind man said just previously. Remember that story? The blind man says, son of David, he realizes you're the Messiah. Now everyone is saying, you're the Messiah. It's so brilliant, and, and they're not wrong. They're not wrong. Jesus really is Messiah. He really is the king of Israel. In fact, the, the New Testament ends on Jesus returns to Jerusalem. There's a huge party. He becomes the eternal king forever and ever. Just like here, except for maybe on a much more massive scale and maybe a little bit different. I mean, everything looks so good here, but we have to ask the question, what in the world happens? Because in a week time, nobody is following this king or his kingdom anymore. They're all, all of them are celebrating. All of them are in. They, they're all saying, I pledge allegiance to this man. And then, nothing. It's all gone. What went wrong? Um, it's because they, they just want an earthly. They just want a king that they they can get that king to do what they want. And what they want is to kick the Romans out of the country and to vindicate them. That's what they wanted for years and years and years. 
We want vindication. We want you to kick the... We're expecting you to be crowned momentarily and then to have a little army and then to go and to beat up the Romans and get them out of the country. And then you'll say, those Romans are bad and you guys are good and you've done the right thing and I'm here to celebrate that. And it's just one glorious celebration on earth. But Jesus is a heavenly king. Now look at this. They say, Hosanna, which is in Aramaic. Save me, sir. Save me, Lord, save me, sir. Okay, and uh, you know Jesus is one who saves. He just says to the to the blind man, "Your faith has saved you." But what they're looking for salvation from is the the momentary situation with Rome, being justified, being told you're you're good, you don't need to do anything, you're you're good, you're not an evil person. Uh, they want a manipulated Messiah, and Jesus is the one to have it. And, and you know, here's a weird thing, right? It's much too painful what actually Jesus wants to do. Jesus does want to save his people, but he wants to save his people from his sins. And, you know, even if you were to tell them that, how would we feel about that? It, it, it's distasteful to think that someone has to die for my sins, that God in heaven has to help me with my mistakes. It's not very glamorous. It's the unglamorous core of Christianity. The cross, the great shame, salvation, not, not so exciting. I think that churches are really tempted um, after a short time to move from the message of the cross and of the Bible as a whole. I think the whole Bible speaks about Jesus and his gift and about his reign. I think we're, we're easily called to, to stay there, but we're tempted to, to make it about wealth or health or powers or signs or success or pragmatic living, all sorts of okay things, much more glamorous than the shame of sin and the glory of Christ. It's so easy to move on. Now look at this. How ironic is this? God is doing his will anyway through their less than accurate rendering of who they think Jesus is. So they say, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, and that word Hosanna, as we saw, right, save us, sir, or save us, Lord. Does anybody know what Jesus' name is? The Lord saves is Jesus' name. So as he's going up into Jerusalem for the final week of his life, God is sending a message, a broken message through broken people, and the message is, Jesus, be who I made you to be. Go and save these people. They don't even know what they need saving from. Save them, and I'll put it in their mouths. And so God, you know, we can even not get what God's kingdom is about, and it still progresses. It progresses through us, even while, we, while we're less than sure about who he is and what he's doing. And this is interesting. Uh, I remember this one particular student um, when I was... Uh, in a, a youth pastor, and this person said, I had thought about committing suicide, okay? I, I was thinking about committing suicide after the fact, well after the fact, uh, but something you said, Tim, uh, made me decide instead of doing that that I was going to trust in Jesus. Uh, and then she told me what it was that I had said to her. And what I had said, I remember distinctly when it came out of my mouth, that I thought to myself, why did I say that? What a stupid thing to say in my head. I thought, there I go again, ruining the world, saying dumb things, and it ends up being the one thing that saves her life and leads her to the Lord. And God, God works through all this. You know, we can't resist what God's kingdom is doing. It's going to progress whether we want it to or not. And, it, and even if we say, I don't want it to progress, we'll become part of the way that it does progress anyway. Because he's Lord. Now look at how this thing ends in verse 11 and 12. It's crazy. Um, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with his wife. Talk about an anticlimax. They're bringing him through the city to a place where you would expect what would happen is that he would have a crown put on his head. And he would be declared the next mighty king 
and then he would form a small army and go and do the bidding of all the Jerusalemites, right? This is what this is what we expect. He's going to go into the temple. They're going to give him authority. They're going to bless what, what he's doing. They're going to say, yes, you are a king. And then he's going to go out and conquer. And he goes in, and he's like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay, guys, it's getting late. Let's go. <laughs> they go back. It's a bit of uh, leaves us a bit cold, doesn't it? Let's call it, guys. Let's go. Why? He refuses to be our patsy king. He, he refuses to just do what the people want. He, he's the real king. And we can't make him be the sort of king we want him to be. He is who he is. We accept him on his terms. And he doesn't accept us on our terms. Um, you know, when you're up on the hill, and um, let's say that you're doing outreach on the hill, you begin to uh, talk to people. Let's say that they're not atheists. If they're not an atheist, and you're up on the hill, and even if they are sometimes, and you broach the subject of Jesus, there are very, very few people who would say, I don't like Jesus. I don't like what he's about. I'm not interested in Jesus. Ah, you know, they're, they're not, that's not what they're going to say. What they will say is, here's my thinking. Here's how I see the world. And look, I picked this one little thing that Jesus did, and I'll, I can fit it into my worldview. And I say, I got Jesus to go along with what I'm doing. And this is our temptation, isn't it? Let's just squeeze Jesus in where we can in our own system of thinking. Or better yet, let's just make God in our own image, and then we'll never have to change. And that's the danger. That's the danger. Jesus says, I'm either your king or I'm not. You get to choose, but let's not have it half. Let's not have it half. Uh, important verse, uh, it's at the, the end of the Beatitudes. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do anything? You don't do what I ask. You don't do what I ask. It's all... For talk, there's no half credit. You really need to go in on this and accept me. And then obey me. Now look at this. What is Jesus actually doing? He's in the temple. He's looking around. He goes home. But the reason he's looking around is because the next day, uh, he's going to pronounce judgment on this place. He's going to come back, and he's going to say, well, I mean, you think about it. Think about the Pharisees, okay? The Pharisees and Sadducees, they've created basically another religion. It's very loosely based on the Old Testament, but not really. It has all these new things that they came up with and new ideas, and Jesus has been interacting with this a bit. And Jesus isn't going to come to them and say, oh, you know, it's, you know I see what you've done here, and there's some good here, and there's some... Uh, other things, and then over here, there's one or two things that are minor points of clarification, but I'm sure we can work with this. I'm sure I can go in and it'd be really okay with what you've done, and let's, let's join forces. But Jesus says, this is my house. I rule this place. You don't want to change. Get out of my house. That's what he'll say tomorrow, <laughs> okay? He throws in the gauntlet. Remember how we started uh, earlier on, we read this passage. Um, it says in Malachi chapter 3, the Lord will come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire. He's coming. Who can endure the day of his coming? He will sit as a refiner and a purifier. And what that word refiner and purifier means is that God takes a, a hunk of rock and he puts fire over it and it gets so hot that it melts. And when it does, all the bad stuff rises to the top. And he just chucks all the bad stuff up. It's this incredibly intense picture. God says, my Messiah does that for us. He's Lord. He rules. He's come to refine. And we come to him. And if we come to him on this weird basis of like, you know, God, I can, I can fit you into what I have here. God says, no, no. I'm going to melt you. Have you thought about that idea? When we come to the Lord... And there we are, melted before his presence, reduced before our king, brought down and refined. God removes things from us that are garbage. 
It's not exactly an easy process. Fall upon this stone and be broken. Whoever the rock falls on, right, is shattered to bits. This is our Lord. And we've been warned in advance that he's like that. Well, so that's our message. Um, Jesus is truly Lord, but is he well and truly your Lord? Jesus is truly Lord. We see that he's truly Lord. He's the, the Lord of all creation, but is he your Lord? And when I say your Lord, what I mean is not, do you say amen at the appropriate time? Can you make a creed? I'm talking about this inner willingness to obey. To do what he asks. And that's actually our big punchline, right? What I'm hoping that you get out of this sermon is obedience. A couple caveats. Okay. The first is, some of us are trying very hard to obey and failing, right? And we feel demoralized about it. We feel very demoralized. I can, I can relate to this, okay? For goodness sakes, I go through this all the time. What do we do when Jesus says, come and obey me? And we say, oh, I'm trying. What Jesus would have us do is not give up on trying. Okay? His grace is sufficient for us. His power is made known in our weakness. Keep going. Don't just say, well, I keep sinning, so I give up. He wants a tenacity in us, a tenacity that says, I am going to keep going in faith until you overcome this in my life. And I'm going to let you. And God takes us on these really, really long stints where it takes ages for him to remove something within us. And the hope is, if you have that thing and you're feeling bad, don't give up. God will chuck it out of your life. Keep being open to him. Keep being open. You know, when we sin, what we generally think is, is that um, we, we can't talk to God, and uh, we're in bad standing with Him, and we got to do a bunch of good things to get back in good standing, and then maybe we'll have a talk about this. But what, what would be very best for you to say is that, you know, you're covered by His blood, and don't give up. God will remove it from you. God will remove it from you, I promise you. What is going on in your heart, in your life, and that old stubborn sin, if it is an issue for you, if you realize that you need to give this to God, He will, he will conquer it. Keep going. And then, uh, secondly, there's this uh, idea of not chucking our brains at the door, right, of Christianity. And, you know, you could say that my sermon tells you to stop thinking about what God tells you to do. Just do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. Just do it. That, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is taste and see that the Lord is good. That you, you may need to realize that what God has told you, though it doesn't look like it's good to you, that there's a whole host of things that we think, is that really good? Is it really good that uh, you know, you tell me to do this or to do that, to not get smashed on an alcohol, to not have inappropriate relationships before marriage, to not do these things. Is it is it really good? I don't think so, God. That doesn't make sense, and it's a whole lot more fun to say yes to those things now. And God says, come, taste, and see. You'll see that this is right if you will submit to me. But if you never submit to me, you'll never know that it's wrong. Ever. There are so many people who say, I don't, I just don't like what God is saying. Well, who does? It's hard. Taste and see if it doesn't bloom and blossom in your life. The Lord is good. So now I want to take a moment to pray. It's a good time to pray and to surrender and to say, God, teach me obedience. Perhaps you've never even prayed those words to him. Teach me obedience. Teach me to say yes to you. Cleanse me of all my sins. Establish my heart in truth. I want to live for you. I'm not giving up on your call on my life. Make it true in you. Let's pray.